students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and Module 4, Ecosystem Dynamics. This is video number 15 and the last in our little series on past ecosystems. We're going to be talking a little bit about discussing trends. You need to be able to investigate the reasons for changes in past ecosystems by evaluating hypotheses that account for identified trends. Now really, this is a pulling together of a lot of the points that we've already been talking about and a lot of the things that you've been working through in this particular section of the module. So we're just going to try and pull some of these together, ask a couple of questions, and then leave you with some investigations to do back in class. I guess the reason that we're interested in all of this is because of how unique the Australian biota is, and because that throws up some interesting questions. Why is it so unique? How long has it been unique? How have the processes that have been occurring in Australia shaped the Australian biota? And how has human habitation, both around 70,000 years ago and then more like 250 years ago, had an impact on the Australian biota? And what is the potential future for the Australian biota? Good science relies on collection and evaluation of data in relation to hypotheses. So we need to have our scientific guesses. A guess is based on what we already know and what we think might happen when we start to look at or collect data. We do know that ecological disturbances can cause changes in ecosystems. These changes can be temporary shifts, maybe seasonal change, and they can be permanent. They can be changes which can actually drive particular species towards extinction. Change in the availability of particular resources can create selecting pressures on organisms and this in turn can drive evolution. So we see change happening at a population level and the changes that happen at a population level can either lead to speciation or it can also lead to extinction. Now we've also tried to focus on the difference between the biotic or the living components that can impact on ecosystems and the abiotic or non-living components. Unfortunately, when we're looking at ecological disturbances, a large proportion of the biotic impacts that have been identified in a lot of ecosystems are those that have been created by humans in one form or another. And this can include things like land clearing, which can also in, uh, involve the use of fires, uh, as well as the chopping down of trees. Um, plagues, the introduction of diseases into new environments, and that there's plenty of examples of where that's occurred and the impact that that's had on the um, extant species. Overgrazing, the um, agricultural practices that put huge amounts of pressure on the soils, on the natural resources, on the water, and as a result can have a flow on effect into different components of the local ecosystems. And also, as we've discussed, introduced species. And we talked about successful examples of introduced species of biological controls and ones that have not been as successful. When we talk about the abiotic factors, some of the non-living components, some of those are associated with the climate and what sort of impact these sorts of changes are having. And as we study climate science and as we recognize that there's been some changes associated with different things that are happening in the climate, we also notice things like the frequency and severity of storms, of floods, of fires and of droughts and the impact that each of these is having not just individually but cumulatively over time. Um, to the different types of natural environments that we see around us. In addition to these sort of climate related impacts, we can also see changes that again, may be linked to human activity, but have themselves created certain types of abiotic factors that are now in excess or uh, in short supply. The use of fertilizers, particularly nitrates and phosphates to improve the soil quality in a lot of agricultural region, regions um, can also lead to problems like eutrophication, which is when all of those beautiful nutrients are leaving the soils where they're designed to promote plant growth and going into the rivers where they still will promote plant growth. But now the, the growth of plants is uncontrolled. It's often associated with algal blooms and the river therefore sometimes can become choked and um, can have a huge impact on the living organisms. Um, so 
even when we try to do things in the environment that helps to improve the quality of the soil, that helps to improve the growth of crops, we can still inadvertently uh, leave biotic consequences as a result of the increased levels of certain chemicals in certain places. And when you're looking at ecology and you're trying to study different types of ecosystems, one of the things that we can focus in on is a keystone species. And the definition of a keystone species is a species which plays a central and crucial role in an ecosystem. Now, your dominant primary producer is usually your keystone species because that's the one that is in the greatest abundance and that is the one that is the start of many in if not all of the food chains and so therefore critical to the food web in a particular environment. It's the one that's doing the job of converting the inorganic matter into organic matter that's going to be able to be used by so many other living things. So something that damages or removes the dominant primary producer is going to have a significant impact on all of the other species in an ecosystem. The loss of the keystone species can have a cascading effect within ecosystems. So once we start to affect one of these very important species in an ecosystem, the flow on effects to all of the other species through the food webs can be devastating. Now I toyed around whether or not it would be worth just going through and walking you through some specific data, but I think there's other opportunities for us to do that later on and also for us to do that in class. So what I thought it might be useful for you is to see if you can think about some of the scientific evidence for some of the questions or statements that we've raised in this little section of the module. What information do we have that Australia was part of the southern continent of Gondwana? It's not now, it's an island, it's an island continent and it's well separated from Antarctica, from India, from South America and Africa, and yet we've talked about the fact that Australia used to be joined to all of these continents as part of that supercontinent of Gondwana. What evidence do we have for that? Climate change, as I've mentioned previously, is one of these very sensitive topics. What actual data do we have that the climate is changing in Australia? What data can we use to discuss the sorts of responses that we should have to changing climate in Australia. What are some of our dominant primary producers? What have we done to the numbers of these? How have we changed ecosystems by changing some of the dominant primary producers in different ecosystems? What evidence do we have for the megafauna? Those large marsupials, the giant wombats, the diprotodon, the giant kangaroos, the pocoptodons. What evidence do we have that they were in this country and how long ago did they um, become extinct? What information do we have about the causes of those extinctions? And again, we've explored a lot of these in different videos, but these are the sorts of questions that we need to be asking. And this is the sort of data that we need to be collecting in order to answer these sorts of questions. And of course, very importantly, and one of the things that goes very much to the issue of megafauna extinctions is human habitation. How long have humans been in the country? What have their land management and forest management practices been? How did they use fire? What evidence do we have for this? And what sort of interactions do we think were likely between the human populations and the native species? This is a lot of questions, and this is what science does. Science asks good questions. It doesn't always collect the data to answer those questions, but good science is actually in the asking of the question and later on the designing of experiments to help you come up with um, potential information that you can use to evaluate and potentially answer those questions. To lead us on from our study of past ecosystems, we need to move next into a look at future ecosystems. I flagged some of the problems that have occurred as a result of the ways that we have interacted with our ecosystems in the present. And certainly unless we examine some of the data that not only can be attributed to some of the questions that we've asked here, but also to some of the more serious questions about what our country and what our planet might look like in 50 years time. But that's the subject of the next little section, the final section of the Ecosystem Dynamics module. Thanks for watching.